Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of stuff. Welcome to a very special episode of The Good Stuff, where we talk with people who are working on solutions to the take-make waste system that's trashing the planet, our communities, and our health. I'm really excited because we're getting ready to release our new film, The Story of Change. It's all about how we can use our power as citizens to make the big changes needed to achieve the clean, healthy, and fair world we deserve. Nowadays, we're so conditioned to think of ourselves as consumers that we may feel that the only way we can make a difference is through our personal choices in the marketplace. Buying the most eco-friendly, non-toxic sunscreen, replacing old energy-wasting light bulbs, or boycotting a chain store that exploits its workers. But even though we may feel more powerful when we flex our individual consumer muscles, Real power to make deeper, lasting change lies in applying our collective citizen muscles. Don't get me wrong. Making ethical choices with our consumer dollars is the right thing to do. It's a great place to start, but it's a terrible place to stop. The truth is we can't shop our way out of the mess we're in. After all, it's not bad shoppers who are putting our future at risk. It's bad government policies and bad business practices. You can buy a Chevy Volt and reduce your carbon footprint, but it won't make much difference in the fight against global warming if the EPA lets General Motors keep selling gas guzzlers. If we really want to change the world, we have to move beyond voting with our dollars and come together to demand rules for our society that put the common good above private gain. That's the kind of fundamental change that's only possible when we join with our neighbors and work together to transform the system. How do we rebuild our flabby citizen muscles? How do we flex those muscles to make change? I pose these tough questions to some of the smartest change makers I know. These are people from whom I've learned a huge amount over the years, and I wanted you, the Story of Stuff community, to hear from them too. On this show, we'll hear what they have to say about the difference between being a consumer and being a citizen. Next time, we'll talk about how being an engaged citizen is absolutely crucial to affect widespread, deep, lasting change. We're in for some fascinating conversations. Conversations that can change the way we think about change. So let's go. I want you to meet some amazing folks whose thoughts, actions, and lives have profoundly influenced me over the years. In their own ways, each is a leader in harnessing the power of citizens to make change. Eric Liu is founder of the Guiding Lights Network. A former speechwriter and advisor to President Bill Clinton, he is the author of Guiding Lights, How to Mentor and Find Life's Purpose, and Gardens of Democracy. Hey, Annie. How are you? Charlotte Brody is Director of Chemical and Public Health Policy at the Blue-Green Alliance, a partnership of environmental groups and labor unions working for a cleaner and fairer American economy. Hello. Lisa Oyos is California Director of the Blue-Green Alliance. Hey, Annie. How are you? Van Jones is President of Rebuild the Dream, a former advisor to President Obama and author of The Green Collar Economy and his newest book, Rebuild the Dream. Hey, how are you? Becky Tarbotten is executive director of Rainforest Action Network, whose campaigns push companies to balance profits with responsible environmental principles. Hello, this is Becky. Roger Kim is executive director of the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, which works to empower low-income Asian Pacific Island communities to achieve environmental and social justice. Thank you so much for inviting me. Ralph Nader needs no introduction. He's the father of the modern consumer movement. Okay. When you hear the word citizen, what comes to mind? Someone born in this country? An immigrant proudly taking the oath of legal citizenship? That's not what we're talking about. Being a citizen is not about your birth certificate or immigration status. Eric Liu says it's about how you engage with the society that you live in. Well, I'm talking about um, something much bigger than legal documentation status. It's really about, in, in the simplest terms, how you show up for life, uh, how you show up for community, and how you live in a way that's not just about you. Uh, I think that's the broadest conception of citizenship. Um, and within the American context, there's also just the question of, you know, how do you live in a way that actually lives up to uh, the very exceptional uh, promise uh, and burden uh, of this country's ideals? Uh, but I think that the broadest sense is, how do you show up for life? So what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, how do you engage in... Um, uh, connecting with others uh, to push for the kinds of change that you want to see in community life, right? Uh, to, to be a citizen is in part uh, to be able and willing to take responsibility 
for the conditions all, all around us. Uh, you know, you, you've heard me say this, Annie. You know, I, I'm fond of uh, quoting a billboard I once saw an image of uh, by a very congested highway, and the billboard said, "You're not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. Our dispositions, our acts, our smallest behaviors uh, cascade and, and become contagious." Uh, in ways that are really important for us to remember. Ralph Nader says citizenship is about freedom, not the freedom to do whatever we want, but a type of freedom that also carries responsibilities. First of all, it, it helps to define freedom the way the ancient Roman orator and lawyer defined it, Marcus Cicero, when he defined freedom as participation in power. And once you define freedom that way, that is an active role for people uh, around the country and the world. Uh, it's not just freedom from arbitrary government or uh, c corporate abuses. It's freedom to shape a society that will open up the opportunities for justice on the part of every possible person uh, in the society. So it's very important to, uh, to uh, develop a, a definition of citizen that encompasses that of the consumer, but uh, is not the reverse, because you can be a a consumer and uh, still buy uh, very damaging things to you and your family, even though they may taste good or they may feel good or they may sound good or they may look good. Uh, but if you're a citizen, you ask the bigger questions as to what are these corporations uh, putting in our environment? Why aren't these uh, government agencies applying law and order to corporate crime, fraud, abuse, to the uh, corporate uh, uh, inundating of our air, water, soil, and food with uh, toxic uh, materials or risking uh, uh, future generation safety with uh, nuclear power or uh, uh, an arms race. We're bombarded thousands of times a day with advertisements that encourage and reinforce our consumer selves. Buying this phone will make us hip. Buying this car will make us sexy. Buying stuff is such a part of our identity that the media often use the word consumers instead of people. On the other hand, most of the messages we get about our influence as citizens are discouraging. We vote, but elections are dominated by campaign contributions from corporations and special interests. Candidates promise change, but once they're in office, it's business as usual. Here's Van Jones, who briefly worked in the Obama White House. There are a lot of ways to make change, and you know, obviously our, our choices as consumers matter. But the reality is your, our individual uh, choice, when we go to the grocery store, when we go uh, shopping online, uh, you're talking about maybe $100, $1,000. Uh, the government every year spends you know, multiple billions of dollars and can completely overwhelm any of the choices that the citizens make if the government's not acting right. And I think we've sometimes, um, especially in the kind of post-Obama moment, we kind of felt like, hey, look, we, we, we bought the Obama uh, app, uh, we pushed the button, uh, everything didn't change right away, so we're, you know, we're just going to go back to trying to shop our way out of the problem. But I think that the reality is that we need uh, both the bottom-up uh, uh, power of changing our consumer behavior, but we also need that top-down uh, engagement, having the government on the people's side, and you only get that by activism, by voting, by being engaged as a citizen. When we're discouraged and disillusioned, we stop exercising our citizen muscles. After a while, we completely forget how to use them. Here's Charlotte Brody. I think the first step is to understand that we've been trained to act as consumers instead of as citizens. And we've been trained that um, our, all of our uh, brain power should be applied to making consumer choices, like which sunscreen or, or taking bags to the store. And that we have not nearly as much uh, training or reinforcement for using our citizen brains or our citizen muscles, which are really our problem-solving brains, not our choice of products brains. Democracies always... Uh, are, are thick with problems, and that it's our job to uh, recognize when there's a problem in our democracy and to figure out what we can do to fix it. The one other big difference between our consumer muscle or our citizen muscle is that our consumer muscle um, encourages us to do things as individuals. But when we have to solve problems in the democracy, 
we have to recognize that it means figuring out how to work with other people. With the rise of the internet and social media, it's easier than ever to mount campaigns that urge people to take personal, individual actions. But even though corporations may take notice of this so-called clicktivism and make cosmetic changes to appease their customers, it's usually not enough to bring deeper change. Becky Tarbotten explains. The key thing about corporations is that, yes, they need our dollars, but they also need to have strong brands and a really good reputation to get business. I think it's a really big mistake to think of challenging corporate power as just about voting with our dollars. The, the real heart of corp challenging corporate power is actually about flipping the balance of power between communities and corporations and saying, look, we give you the mandate and the right to exist and do business here, and therefore we want to ensure that social and environmental principles are put before profits. We could have 50,000 people close their accounts at Bank of America. That impacts very little on Bank of America's bottom line. But what really impacts Bank of America is when there's a thousand people outside their shareholder meeting and the inside of their shareholder meeting is dominated by people speaking directly to their board of directors saying, we do not support the way this bank does business. And we will not be quiet. We will not sit down until you change um, the way you treat the communities that you, that you operate in, the way you fund climate change and not fund renewable energy, and, and so on. But if we start as consumers, we're always sort of we're playing within their framework, and it means that we're always on the back foot. But if we start as citizens and use our uh, the, the power of not only protest, but the power of conversation, the power of story, the power of just standing up and saying, I don't, I don't cooperate, then we can get many, many, many steps ahead of the game and, and actually push for much broader change. According to Lisa Oyos, that's the kind of citizenship that puts the fear of God, or rather the fear of change, into corporations. Big corporations don't like citizen engagement. They're trying to fight it. They're trying to make money speak louder than the power of people. Systematically, as corporations have more power, our public sector is atrophying. It's not just a citizen engagement muscle. It's not just we're not doing enough. It's harder to make an impact because of Citizens United, because of super PACs. And we just have to take that and say, it may be that way tomorrow, but 10 years from now, it's going to be different because I'm going to make it different. And so is my neighbor, and so is my sister, and we're just going to keep fighting. Part of the problem is that many of us who are working for a more just society, for fairness and equality, have become uncomfortable with the term citizen. In recent years, we've seen hateful campaigns to deny rights to people who don't have the right legal papers, to close the borders or send immigrants back where they came from. Here's Roger Kim. What does citizen mean to you when you are spending so much time working with people who are not technically U.S. citizens but are engaging as citizens to make their communities better? Right, and I have the same biases you had, Annie, about the word citizen, and, and frankly, we still don't use that word. I think I still have some of those biases, especially in the way that that term is, is you know, used in, in our everyday language and, and, frankly, used against our communities in a lot of ways. Um, you know, trying to define who is a citizen and who is not a citizen in in the paper sense. So, um, but you know, we we engage our members and in, in our communities um, in very much the broad sense of citizen, as you've described it, um, in being involved in the in the everyday uh, activities and um, um, you know issues that are affecting uh, their 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 community, their everyday lives, um, and that means you know both in terms of uh, ways that they can get involved when they do have quote unquote citizenship um, by you know going and voting but you don't have to be a citizen to go speak at city, city council um, you can just be you know a resident of a particular community and still have your voice heard and we make sure that that happens and we should be grateful that uh, people's voices count and matter um, and uh, to, to not take that power that people have uh, at the ballot box or to get engaged in uh, in public policy at city councils uh, is a huge, huge travesty. Uh, and we, you know, have defended that right for uh, hundreds of years in this country and, and have built that right through struggle through hundreds of years in this country. And we've, it's a precious one that we need to, to hang on to. Eric Liu. Just because a concept can or has been abused um, is no reason to actually abandon proper use of the concept. Our obligation as Americans as inheritors to this creed uh, is particularly, uh, if you are offended by those abuses of the word citizenship, it's particularly to redouble your efforts to reclaim it.
Uh, the purpose of citizenship uh, in the United States especially uh, is to live in this pro-social way and to force this country to live up just a little bit more than it did yesterday to its stated creed of equality and opportunity for all. Again, I'm not saying it doesn't matter if we bring our values to our shopping and day-to-day lifestyle choices. Of course, when we buy stuff, it's good to buy the least toxic, least exploitative product. And when we're making choices about our home, our transportation, our diet, it's good to think about the impacts those choices have on the planet and on our neighbors. These are all good things to do. I do them, and I hope you do too. There are lots of reasons that making green choices in our daily lives is good. It feels good. It demonstrates another way. And it's a way to let corporations know that we don't approve of products that trash people and the planet. When consumer pressure is backed up with a bold campaign, one that harnesses our citizen power, it can influence corporations to change their ways. But the fact is, there's a difference between doing good and making change. To make the kind of change we need now, we've got to work our citizen muscles to engage together to build a healthy, sustainable, and just future. Thanks for joining this conversation about what it means to be a citizen. What about you? What do you think? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please post a comment on storyofstuff.org. And stay tuned for the second half of this discussion when our guests will talk about how we can make change. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rowland. Post-production by Brandon McFarland. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.